Santiago, where I first learned about forced disappearance, which is one of the human rights crimes that I focus on in what became chapter one of my dissertation. But I realized that once we work in coalitions that cross boundaries between art and literature and film and politics and anthropology and creative forms of all kinds, then there really was something that we could accomplish together. You know, we live and breathe ideas as scholars. That's what we like to do. We love to teach. We love to <laughs> build our fields, but we like to have time for our work and we benefit from each other. So that was the idea that we needed to have a kind of advanced study center uh, where these, where we could meet, where we could exchange work, where we could push each other to develop our own scholarship and our ideas collaborating across the university. So that's how it started. Well, it's had a major impact on my writing. Um, the Engendering Archives group was my writing group. Having met with them over five years, they also became my intellectual community. It's usually people come together like this in a conference or that lasts several days or even like a short summer school for a week. But we envisioned three-year working groups so that people could meet regularly, read together, read each other's work, um, have occasions in which to bring in outside speakers or create conferences, meet in different places around the globe uh, using Columbia's global centers in order to deepen and broaden the conversation around certain topics. Well, we have two research streams. One is uh, imagining uh, justice and the other is women creating change. In our women creating change stream, one of the projects that I've been involved with, which I simply loved, was women mobilizing memory. It became one of our practices to do memory walks around the city of Istanbul, where we visited sites where sort of traumatic or important events had occurred. We did memory walks in Chile, we did memory walks here in our Harlem community. It's become an incredibly strong network. The key words really are create and change because that is part of what the mission of the center is. It's not just to diagnose what's wrong, it's really to try to envision possibilities, alternatives, to envision an alternative future. The center has definitely enhanced Colombia as an intellectual community. I think that it's been a way of finding and locating people in different parts of the university, encouraging them to come together and work together, really creating a sense of community of thinkers who are engaged in intellectual projects, but they're projects that are also engaged beyond the academy, engaged in real world issues and questions, but providing the time for a kind of slow thinking about issues that might seem urgent, um, but that require time to think about and people to discuss those questions with. The center has been very important in creating that kind of space at Columbia. I'm actually a grad student on the medical campus um, doing my master's in public health. In my role as a bioethics student, what really drew me into this field at the start was the interdisciplinary aspects of it. Um, and that's what brought me to this working group because I really wanted to take what I learned in the classroom and apply it to meet people with so many different perspectives who have an important stake in precision medicine. I can't really think of any other center that aspires to this level of kind of expansiveness. It's not just interdisciplinarily, by which I mean, you know, an additive notion that we must have every school represented at the Center for the Study of Social Difference, but that somehow thinking interdisciplinarily while at the same time harnessing your own deep skills and scholarship might allow us to ask really big questions in much more robust, but I think also meaningful ways. And as I said, there's no place at the university that does this. I think of the Center for the Study of Social Difference as having been born around the same time as the global centers, and we've actually worked together from the beginning. I've actually uh, organized four conferences of working group, working group meetings with the global centers, three in Amman and one in Paris.
I think what we often fail to do in the world is to recognize the differences. We focus so much on the similarities, and those are important to acknowledge, but the acknowledgement of the differences helps us then move away from a paradigm of assuming that what is important in one context is important in all contexts, or uh, how we view things, say, in North America is how the rest of the world should view the same things. The Women Creating Change Leadership Council is comprised of women and men who come from a variety of backgrounds as well as geographic locations. They have skill sets in public relations, in media, in the business world, in the legal world, with NGOs and with government organizations. And the objective of the members of the Council, our mission, is to ensure that this incredibly valuable research that's being done in our academic community has impact beyond the university and influences not only programs but thinking on gender issues generally. After becoming a, a fellow with the Precision Medicine Group, I was recently invited to uh, a conference at the Yale Law School that was one of the high-profile uh, high conferences on cancer, uh, cancer and policy. And there were people there, representative from the national, uh, from the NIH, from the FDA, from the NCI, a bioethicist, economist, and I had a seat at the table. Center projects uh, impact the university and the world beyond in multiple ways. One is that they're presenting a, a, another model to how to conduct research at the level of the university, which I think is the most exciting model available. But also, the work that we do here inherently engages problems, questions, communities that are not contained by the university. For instance, in our case, we are engaging events in Puerto Rico, but also in the Caribbean. And in our next set of projects, we're also engaging other countries, Greece, Argentina, Spain. And that grows in, in organically from the work we do. When you start asking questions and you start putting them in a global context, like most of our work does, that inherently leads you to engage in conversations with uh, people in, out, and beyond your immediate community. It's an honor and a pleasure to be introducing this conference and to be able to celebrate 10 years of really extraordinary effort in scholarship, collaboration, teaching, and, the, and in the dissemination of new ideas and knowledge. I think that video beautifully, and for me even movingly, um, captures what the Center for the Study of Social Difference and the Women Creating Change initiatives have brought to Columbia over their 10 and five year lives. These women and men are exceptional scholars and intellectuals, and they're working together creatively in a spirit of inquiry, openness, and forward momentum on projects that range across many different subjects and which touch on and, which touch on and transpire in many different locations um, around the world. I thought Professor Rao put it very well when she said that these scholars bring the work of their own fields and disciplines where they've trained and written and influenced colleagues and had a contribution. They bring that into vibrant dialogue with colleagues from many other departments and even other schools across the campus. These are dynamic intellectual spaces, spaces literally, but spaces mostly uh, figuratively, that generate a kind of energy and commonality among their diverse participants. We might say, borrowing from Salman Rushdie, that this is where, this is how newness is being brought into the world. I was struck by the fact that the video opened with the voice of a graduate student. It also included at least one university professor, I bet you could have spotted her, not to mention the university president, and of course, the Center for the Study of Social Difference and the Women uh, Creating Change, these are groups where diversity of every kind is welcomed and celebrated, as well as being studied and contextualized. 
The work of these two groups is serious, hard-hitting scholarship oriented around the principle of positive change. And the atmosphere is collective and mutually engendering. And I think we all got a sense of that watching that short video. So it's a great honor and pleasure then to welcome you all to this anniversary conference. My name is Sarah Cole, and I'm the Dean of Humanities here at Columbia. In my work as Dean, one of the things I do is to, to try to think toward the best futures for humanistic scholarship and inquiry at Columbia. To ask, what can the humanities here model for our peers, for our students, and for those outside of the university? And how can we embody the ideal or our ideals of engaged humanities? And over and over in conversations with many different kinds of people, I come back to these groups, the Center for the Study of Social Difference and Women Creating Change, as two of our great examples. In the list of sponsors on your program and in the conversations that you just saw in those videos, um, you'll notice the presence of many, many different groups across the Columbia campus, not only across the arts and sciences, not only departments and centers with which many of us work um, with some frequency, but also uh, with the law school, with the medical school, importantly, of course, uh, with Barnard, the School of the Arts is a major uh, part of all of this. And that's just the beginning, on out from there through the global centers, which I thought uh, was really nicely, that was the uh, end point there, and I think that sense of a kind of ongoing, outward-focused movement in these projects is really central. Um, these collaborations then are varied and potentially transformational in so many ways. More, as many of us think about what kinds of meaningful impact our academic work can have, the Women Creating Change Project reminds us that the university can be a thriving place of interaction between scholars and students, of course, um, but also with many others in their near and further communities. We know that the university can be a laboratory or an incubator, but in this group, it's a place of action. It is in the stream of history, and it insists that this matters. Our conference today is titled, What We Can Do When There's Nothing to Be Done, Strategies for Change. And I think I probably speak for many of us in this room when I say that I'm grateful to this group for asking that question and for helping each of us to begin to answer it. As an academic, a scholar, a woman, a mother, and a resident of planet Earth, I'm deeply conscious of the need for forums such as these and I want to acknowledge not only the great work of these two groups as a whole, but the extraordinary and fabulous people who are bringing us together today as they've been doing for five and 10 years, helping to construct our futures so that we can imagine wanting to live in them. Three of these extraordinary and fabulous women are coming to the podium now to introduce the day, the founding co-directors of the Center for Study of Social Difference, and faculty members with long affiliations with the Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality. Scholars, teachers, unbelievably great mentors to students and younger colleagues, leaders here at Columbia and well beyond, I'm delighted and proud to be able to welcome Laila Abu Lugod, the Joseph Butenweiser Professor of Social Science and member of the Department of Anthropology, and two very dear colleagues from the Department of English and Comparative Literature, Jean Howard, George Delacorte Professor of Humanities, and Marianne Hirsch, William Peterfield Trent, Professor of English and Comparative Literature. Please join me not only in welcoming, but in thanking them. Welcome, everybody, and I want to thank Sarah Cole not only for her help with this conference, but for her support for um, the uh, center and for all the work she's doing for the humanities at Columbia. It's wonderful to have a, a feminist dean. <laughs> On the day after the riveting spectacle of male rage unleashed in Washington, <laughs> It is hard to believe that the moral arc of history really does bend toward justice. Yet the Center for the Study of Social Difference, which has organized this conference, is invested in helping to bend that arc. We three co-founders helped establish CSSD to make possible a kind of scholarship hard to promote in soloed, siloed departments. Scholarship that's interdisciplinary, collaborative, and committed. 
scholarship that explores questions and problems that can only be opened up by using the expertise of many different people working together over a sustained period of time. As an intellectual undertaking, CSSD has been a source of joy and solidarity, precious commodities both. Together in our various projects, work on the Puerto Rico debt crisis, on gender violence, on environmental justice and prison education, we have produced many books, many new courses, many white papers, conferences, exhibits, plays, and protest actions that aim to promote justice. Imagining justice and creating change, those are the goals of CSSD. They're simple to say, they're hard to achieve, but nothing is gained without struggle. In her new book, Feel Free, Zadie Smith writes, partly in response to those who challenge her optimism, that, quote, as the departing president, oh, that we had him, well understood, in this world there is only incremental progress. Only the willfully blind can ignore that the history of human existence is simultaneously the history of pain, of brutality, mass extinction, every form of venality and cyclical horror. No land is free of it, no people are without their blood stain, no tribe entirely innocent. But there is still this redeeming matter of incremental progress. It might well look small to those whose apocalyptic, with apocalyptic perspectives, but to she who not so long ago could not vote or drink from the same water fountain as her fellow citizens or marry the person she chose or live in a certain neighborhood, such incremental change feels enormous. This morning, I feel as if I would like a revolution and not incremental change. But Smith reminds me of the different time frames and different perspectives we must bring to bear on the question, is change possible? And if so, who or what will bring it? CSSD, by promoting critical thought, collaboration, and commitment to a more just future, aspires to be part of a much needed mobilization of progressive forces. We invite you all today to think with us about how better to realize that aspiration. Thank you. Jean uh, just talked about how we work, uh, and several of the people in the video, slowly, reflectively, collaboratively, and about how we dreamed when we founded CSSD. Uh, of creating this vibrant interdisciplinary intellectual space for exchanging ideas and advancing critical scholar scholarly and artistic work of the kind of extraordinary colleagues that we have here at Columbia, as well as connecting to all our colleagues around the world. Um, and we struggled to find a name uh, for that which bound us together. Uh, how could we capture the particular and urgent social and political issues that we were all determined not just to understand uh, as critical scholars and practitioners, but to address and to redress? Uh, and we came together with colleagues affiliated with uh, key centers and institutes at Columbia that had emerged like their counterparts um, elsewhere from the social and political movements, let's say, of the 1970s and their demands for analyses of power and inequality and inclusion for those who had been excluded. These centers had pressed for serious scholarly attention to forms of injustice based on such categories as race, gender, ethnicity, sexuality, geography, uh, faculty and students connected to the uh, Institute for Research on Women, Gender, and Sexuality, the Institute for Research in African American Studies, now a department, I believe, Mabruk, uh, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity, and the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society, as well as Barnard's longstanding Center for Research on Women. And e each of us were working, sometimes separately, to analyze these structures of power and the ways that inequality had been historically and was now being organized globally around and in through these categories. So these were lines of social difference. These lines of social difference were lines of power. And the enforcement of these differences were modes of producing and naturalizing injustice, forms of inequality and structural violence. And we understood gender, race, 
ethnicity, class, culture, sexuality, as social constructs that sorted people in ways that sustained inequality and justified violence. Even if we embrace and deploy creatively these categories ourselves, those labeled, those grouped that way, um, through these lines of difference, we had to figure out how they did the work of exclusion, of erasure, of silencing, of denigration, of discrimination, of harm, of exploitation. At the Center for the Study of Social Difference, we think about these lines of social difference intersecting and constantly shifting shape in relation to each other, prioritizing some over others in some projects, in other as some aspects of our work, such, such as the initiative on women creating change, but trying to think them together, uh, always. And this is why we carry the name Social Difference. Uh, and it's a remarkable, and exciting to be celebrating the 10th anniversary of this collective project today and to know how many of you also think that the matters we think about are urgent uh, and uh, we're glad to be able to support anyone who wants to think along these lines. So thank you for being here. Thank you for our speakers. And I will turn it over to Mariana, who really is the visionary uh, behind this conference, we all, everything we do is collective, but it takes a very special person to conceive of something this big, and it really is you, Mariana, and Catherine Lasota, who, without whom uh, we really could not uh, manage, so thank you. Uh, I'll just grab that. I think I wasn't in my script to say thank you, but I have to say thank you. Okay. It's really good to be here with all of you today, especially today, especially this morning, at a moment when we really might throw up our hands and wonder what can be done. Um, you see how lucky I've been in my years at Columbia to be working with these wonderful colleagues and to be able to uh, build um, a community together at this center. We're here to celebrate our anniversary today and we're here to discuss what we can do when there's nothing to be done. So I wanna speak just briefly about this choice of subject, how it emerges from the vision of our center, and let me do so as a literature professor who parses words by just thinking about the title. So this title, of course, is an echo of a, the title of a political pamphlet that a Lenin published in 1902, Stodelet, What is to be done? in itself an allusion to a, uh, a novel by the 19th century Russian revolutionary Nikolai Chernyshevsky. But there's a couple of significant changes that we made to Lenin's uh, title. Today, we're not actually asking the question. We're, um, but we're both exploring in the what, right? Um, the undetermined what, and asserting that we can do something. There's no period after it, but it's not, the, it doesn't go up at the end, that, that title. So, um, and the other title, uh, the other change, I think, is that the title is not passive, what is to be done, but we're introducing an agent, and the agent we're introducing is the we. And I have to say the we is not uncontroversial, and I have to say that some of my co-conspirators on our organizing committee really were not that happy when we first thought of saying we. What is we? Who is speaking for whom? How can you pretend to be speaking for somebody? Can any group speak for another group? Can we here at Columbia introduce a we that would be speaking for the larger world? It's not advisable. So I guess what I would like to do this morning, <laughs> but I'm stubborn. Uh, <laughs> What I'd like to do this morning is suggest that the we here today, and especially today, is an invitation. It's a wager, maybe just provisional, maybe just for today, to join and think together about what we can do, gathering strategies for change, and gathering strength from this privilege of being able to be here together for an entire day, thinking and working together um, in collaboration bringing our questions, bringing our energies, bringing our passions to this new space and making it true to its name. It's called the forum. So making it a forum 
for shared action, and for shared work. But then what kind of work? This capitalized can, together with the do, is quite insistent, it's quite a, an insistent response to the powerlessness that's contained in the what is to be done or what can we do. Um, certainly, some of the things we will be discussing, activist social movements, responses to the crises of refugees, lives across the globe, these demand forms of action. But at the Center for the Study of Social Difference, at Women Creating Change, we describe our work as imagining justice and creating change. Our forms of action are manifold. They include thinking, they include writing, they include discussing, endless discussing, arguing, they include creating, and they include imagining. What we can do, what we can think, what we can create through arts of intervention, another topic for this afternoon, what we can imagine, and that's where we ending, are ending up at the end of the afternoon, what we can imagine when we face the present and envision the future. So it's good to be here to undertake this work with you today, this manifold work. Before uh, we open the floor to our first panel, we have to make a few thanks and announcements. So first, um, Lila already mentioned, I want to thank Catherine Lasota, the associate director, who produced the film, who produced the conference, who produces everything we do. Catherine's really proven that we can do things, even if we think they're impossible. Um, I want to thank Mira Anand, who's our Director of Development and External Relations, and who keeps us on our message. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank Aya Eldosugi, who's Interim Program Manager, Kevin Windhauser, who's our Graduate Fellow, the many, many different workers and volunteers who make all this possible. I'd like to thank the President's Office and President Bollinger for welcoming us to this gorgeous new space and the Harlem community in whose space we are having these conversations. I want to thank Ann Kaplan, who's the director of the Women Creating Change Leadership Council and who has been shepherding us through so many ups and downs, mainly ups, uh, through our last five years and who has been incredibly generous in her support. I want to thank our co-sponsors. You have a long list in your program and I think it gives you a sense of the web that we're trying to create at Columbia uh, and beyond. And I want to thank the generous conference planning committee. Uh, we had so much fun trying to put this together, but uh, we're always so appreciative when people give up their time to try to create something like this together. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining this conversation. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm, one more thing before the panel starts. Sorry, I'm Catherine. Um, thank you for attending today. I just have a few quick announcements. I want to demystify the ticket process for today so you understand how you can move in and out of the symposium today. When you checked in downstairs, you received a program and a forum sticker. Please hold on to that. It serves as your ticket to re-enter the building. Seating's limited and first come, first served, and uh, the registration does not guarantee entry, so um, we will give priority entry and re-entry to ticket holders, so hold on to your ticket and return to the building at least 10 minutes before a session starts to re-enter if you do have to leave. You won't need to leave the building if you don't want to necessarily because all of our coffee breaks will be held right outside here um, by the auditorium. Our first coffee break, I know it's a long morning, we'll have some fruit available to uh, give you some blood sugar. And uh, what else, just a couple things. Um, as the day moves on and more people come out in the rain, please do try to not leave gaps between you and the seats. We're expecting more and more people as the day progresses. There are restrooms right outside the auditorium here. There's a lactation room outside the auditorium here. There are gender neutral restrooms on the third floor and the first floor. And um, please do turn off the ringers on your cell phones. Thanks. And let's see, anything else? Oh, there will be pre-made lunch selections available for purchase. 
uh, during the lunch break in the cafe on the ground floor and also in the lobby of Jerome L. Green next door. Uh, Book Culture will be selling books starting at the first coffee break and throughout the day right outside the auditorium. There will be question cards um, that you may have received when you came in and they'll be collected by the ushers right after our speakers do their initial presentations for the moderated portion of the discussion. I think that's everything. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the presentations. I'd like to welcome our first panel to come up to the stage. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I'm Farah Jasmine Griffin. Um, thrilled to be here. Pleased to welcome you to this first session of the Center for the Study of Social Differences 25th Anniversary Symposium. 10th, 20th, 25th, 10th anniversary. I just got back from Europe last night. I'm still in a different time zone. So, 10th Anniversary Symposium. What we can do when there's nothing to be done. Uh, this first session will focus on protests and social movements, and it asks, how do movements build? How are they sustained in the face of repression? What do they learn from each other? We hope to connect cases from different parts of the globe as a way of reflecting on these questions and think together about how social movements can affect change. As I reflect upon these questions, I cannot help but think about our location this morning we sit on the westernmost boundary of the historic neighborhood of Harlem, a space that has given birth to or participated in political and cultural movements for social change that have influenced the world. Throughout much of its history, it has been home to a group of people of African descent who have had every reason to believe that nothing could be done in the face of an intransient white supremacy and other forms of domination and exploitation. And yet, this kind of thinking has never been an option. It is a community that has won some battles and perhaps lost even more, but has never ever given up on its effort to change the world. This morning, we are fortunate to have four distinguished speakers who will share reflections on specific forms of activism and organizing. I will not introduce them in depth um, because of time, but invite you to read their bios in um, your programs. Um, but our speakers are Aisha Altine, um, an anthropologist from Istanbul, Turkey, Maria Jose Contreras from the School of Theater in Santiago, Chile, Nora Erekat, who joins us from George Mason University, and Kianga Yamata Taylor, uh, who is in African American Studies at Princeton University. Each speaker will speak for 10 minutes. I will follow with reflections and questions raised by their presentations and ask them to respond either to my questions or more importantly to each other for about 20 minutes. And then we'll turn to questions from the audience which will have been collected beforehand and our speakers will respond. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. It's not easy to be the first speaker, but it was incredibly inspiring to listen to our co-organizers who put this amazing day together. I'm truly thrilled and uh, deeply honored to be a part of this exciting conversation on what we can do when there's nothing to be done. To me, the answer to the underlying question here is at some level quite obvious. We can come together in new and old ways co-creating, co-witnessing, and co-resisting. And this is something that the Center for the Study of Social Difference, bringing together academics, activists, and artists, has been exploring with great creativity in its 10 years, and which I've had the pleasure and privilege to experience uh, in the context of the women mobilizing memory work that we've been doing in Santiago, Istanbul, New York, since 2013. I'm truly grateful to Mariana Hirsch and Jean Howard, and all of my fellow mobilizers, Maria Jose, and everyone else here and not here uh, for the great inspiration that they have been, especially as our lives in Turkey took more and more challenging turns in recent years. 
So what are some of the new and old ways of coming together and co-create, co-witness and co-resist? I know that we'll be hearing many inspiring examples um, of this from around the world today, and there's a lot I can share uh, with you from the Turkish context, but given the short time that I have, I will focus on what for me has been the most surprising and exciting journey of the past few years, our work at Su Gender, the center where I um, work on transformative activism. To me, this journey has been the radical extension of the personal is political in that it has invited all of its participants to rethink and reweave the connections between personal and political transformation, personal and political healing. In her inspiring book, The Better Story, Queer Affects from the Middle East, Dina Georges invites us to explore the power of personal and collective storytelling as human responses to histories of injury and look more closely into both the ways in which we work out the events that change us through our storytelling and the limitations of our existing stories, which often resist renewal and transformation. In George's term, every story is the better story or the best possible story we have invented to allow ourselves to go on living and we can always do better than our better story. If our stories are about survival and our means to survive, the work of mourning becomes crucial to, I quote her, the work of submitting ourselves to the possibility that there might be a better story than our better story. So the main question I've been asking myself is, what is the better story of political transformation? And more specifically, what can be the better story of feminist and queer transformation, especially when so many of our stories from around the world are shaped by a sense of there's nothing or little to be done. The planet today is indeed shaped by deeply destructive forces, the consequences of which range from climate change to wars, from poverty to precarious living, um, to racist and heterosexist violence. Yet, we're also witnessing a time of major transformations, especially in relation to <coughs> conventions on gender and sexuality. And where I'm speaking from, contemporary Turkey, uh, it's a place where both the most destructive forces and the most transformative ones are finding strong expression. Thousands of people are in jail for simple acts of political expression, and hundreds of academics have lost their jobs and or went on exile following the criminalization of a peace petition that more than 2,000 of us signed in early 2016. Close to 400 academics are facing charges in the courts, including myself. Grace Lee Boggs, the legendary activist and philosopher who I've recently discovered, and what a late discovery, <laughs> asks in relation to Detroit. What do you see when you look at the vacant lot? Do you see devastation or possibility? Possibility for growing food for your community and for helping people think differently about change. So I think this is an emblematic question for our times, one that has become an urgent question of survival in places like Detroit or Turkey, perhaps before some others. I agree with Box, who passed in 2015, but shed beautiful light on the contemporary moment until her last days, that this question is an existential question for the whole planet, and that there's a widespread search in all communities around the world to imagine a new politics of possibility that's shaped by deep personal and political transformation. So let me say a few words about our journey of transformative activism, which is actually at its initial steps of becoming. Last year, exactly around this time, with my colleague Sema Simich, an outstanding queer activist, we set out on an unknown, unpredictable journey that we call, called transformative activism, rethinking gender and politics, and some of the people who inspired and enabled that journey are here with us today, Luan and Cheney. We're grateful uh, for your presence and support. Responding to an open call, about 20 feminist, queer, and human rights activists from five cities in Turkey, some involved in grassroots initiatives, other working or volunteering for NGOs, came together one day a month for nine months, and then for four days in a retreat setting to engage in a number of bodily activities. Yoga, five rhythms movement, dance, meditative breath work, sitting and other forms of meditation, storytelling, and so on. In the course of this year, some of us faced court cases, others lost their jobs, others faced death threats and could not work in their offices for weeks. Almost everyone had friends and colleagues get arrested, if not themselves, and many of their regular um, activist work was interrupted, canceled, or banned altogether. 
Many of the people in the group expressed that the space we created together was where they felt the safest, not only physically, but also in terms of being cared for, most of all by themselves, and feeling free to experiment with new ways of bringing the personal together with the political and the collective, the body with the mind and the heart, healing with justice, commitment and belonging with saying yes to oneself. Most people in the group had not practiced any yoga before. Almost no one had a meditation practice or even experience. Some of them had never danced before in the company of others, let alone other activists. To come back to the question raised by this day, when there was nothing to be done under intense political and social pressure, pressure we were giving ourselves a chance to try something new. Certainly not new in the history of humanity, but new for us. And the result has been more transformative and empowering and liberating than any of us could have imagined, and the journey continues. As facilitators working with a group of grassroots activists, we realized early on that the last thing we need to worry about when you're working with activists is dissemination. That's what activists know how to do best. They cannot not disseminate. And they do it in the worst possible circumstances, from prisons to police stations to refugee shelters, and in the most creative ways. And if I'm here today talking to you feeling not, without feeling anxious about being perceived as naive or cuckoo, uh, it's because I know that I'm not alone. When we delve into deep personal transformation as political transformation, many of us start out feeling terrified of losing our anger, our resolve to fight for justice, our altruistic self, our comfort zones of belonging, our habit of blaming others for being wrong and evil, and our claim to innocence and goodness and fairness. Being invited to touch one's creative side might be scary in its own right, as we have both intimate and collective memories of having been punished for expressing our creativity, which is where our deepest insights and wisdom lie. Transformative activism is hard work and deeply courageous work, as it invites us to face our demons inside as much as the evil and the injustice outside. It requires persistent, loving labor and an openness to change, an openness to look at all of our conventions and revolutionize our relationship to ourselves, to each other, and to the planet. It requires an openness for joy as much an openness for facing our vulnerabilities. In the course of this one year, one thing we realized over and over again is that it's a lot more difficult for activists to receive than to give, to receive care, to receive love, to receive help, to connect to and receive our own bodies, to claim joy and to embody it. As ironic as it sounds, as activists, we can be the furthest away from the worlds we're struggling to create. I guess one can say the same for academics. So at its core, transformative activism is about discovering what is alive in us and opening space for that aliveness to find expression, both personally and collectively. And this is what I mean by co-creating. For me, transformative politics is life-enhancing politics, creativity-enhancing politics, community-enhancing politics. It's a creative politics that comes from a space of saying yes to ourselves, an important part of which involves saying no to injustice, violence, inequality, and domination of all sorts. And for that to happen, one has to learn to co-witness the consequences of one's own pain and suffering, as well as our collective experiences of pain and suffering and submit to what Judith Butler and Dina Georges, among others, call for the work of mourning. That is, surrendering to the process of renewal and transformation that follows loss, the result of which one cannot know in advance. Living in these times is first and foremost learning to live with uncertainty and ambivalence, and learning to surrender to processes of constant renewal and transformation. Transformative politics is about opening ourselves up to our better story, personal and collective better stories, and as soon as that openness is there, there's always something to be done. Because there's always a better story of our current better story, a form of co-resistance that does not come from a space of blind reaction, a space of revenge and destruction, a space of self-righteous arrogance, but from a space of deep awareness of our own responsibilities for being the change that we want to see, a space of understanding interconnectedness of the many struggles that shape our contemporary moment, and a space of creativity. It's only when we're able to collectively respond and not react with creativity that we'll be able to transform the deeply destructive energies that surround our planet, our lives, and our politics. So let me end with a quote from Grace Lee Boggs, um, which she wrote in early 2010s. 
We're beginning to understand that world is always being made and never finished, that activism can be the journey rather than the arrival, that struggle doesn't always have to be confrontational, but can take the form of reaching out to find common ground with many others in our society. This is the kind of transformational organizing we need in this period. I would add this is the kind of transformational theorizing we need in academia and feminist and queer theory with their strong ties to the deeply transformative moments of our times and with their openness to explore the interconnectedness of the personal, the political, and the academic have the potential to take the lead in transforming academic cultures. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much for this invitation uh, to all the organizers uh, committee. I'm really excited to be here with you and share with you what's going on in Chile in the last uh, few months, what has been called the feminist tsunami. In a matter of days, the wave of feminist protests and strikes reach other faculties and schools across the country. Students at more than 25 universities left classes and occupied campuses, demanding greater measures of protection in the wake of numerous denunciations of sexual harassment and, ra and rapes. The feminist wave grew rapidly in the halls and classrooms of our schools and universities because it resonated with the experience of most of us. Occupied campuses became, became safe territories, offering the infrastructural conditions where interpersonal trust, support, and mutual comprehension becomes possible. After affects circulated in and through the bodies, finding novel ways to collectively cope with fear and rage, but also to build on hope and happiness. The sharing of memories, thoughts, and practices allows the creation, the creation of caring circles where solidarity emerges as an alternative way of relating to each other. These safe environments allow the emergence of collective political agency and creativity. As the, as the movement grew, the initial focus broadens. Petitions in different schools and faculties transforms from the claim of protocols to true manifestos that highlight how the educational market-based system reproduces patriarchy and colonialism. Faculty in many universities supported and joined the movement. Protesters call for university to address language used in classrooms, the lack of female authors in reading lists, and the lack of women in positions of authority. At this point, the word feminism does not only resonate in schools and universities, but you can hear it as a constant murmuring throughout the city. During May 2018, the, worst, the word most frequently Googled in Chile is feminism. <laughs> Curiously, it is, it is recurrently associated with the word why. Why feminism? <laughs> feminism why? 71% of the population supports the movement. The feminist wave starts to grow as a feminist tsunami. On May the 23rd, President Sebastián Piñera, ambitioning just a little portion of the increasing popularity of the movement, gives a nationally broadcasted speech to communicate his administration's gender agenda. The agenda shrewdly evades the fundamental requests of the movements to concentrate on small, dumb, populist reforms, such as, and I quote, the end of the discrimination that prevents a woman from remarrying before 270 days after the dissolution of a previous marriage bond. Very important. All of the 12 points of the gender agenda respond to an heteronormative and conservative conception of women. Instead of appeasing the movement, the opportunistic move of the president ignites the already convulsed feminists. Two days after the president's announcement, more than 300 students take the main campus at, of Universidad Católica, where I work. The movement demands to modify policies to prevent and punish sexual harassment. 
Along with the issues related to sexual violence, the movement advocates for the regulation of the contracts of some of the outsources in, workers in the university. After the occupation, the feminist collective decides to sign an agreement with the president. The agreement uh, is on solving the situation with the outsourced workers, the revisions of the protocols of prevention and punishment of sexual violence, the institutional acknowledgement of the social names of trans people, along with the duplication of neutral and inclusive restrooms in every campus. In a highly hierarchic and Catholic university, such as Universidad Católica, this was a major triumph for the movement. The feminist tsunami calls marches and demonstrations that convey thousands of peoples in the streets of Santiago and other cities throughout the country. The movement exceeds the participation of women, implying professors, LGBTQ communities, work unions. Protesters waste creativity. The body appears as the preferred device to mobilize political critique, enact resistance, and communicate power. Some use iconic images, such as blood in their hands. Some theatrically represent the victims of femicidios. Others prefer to use their bodies as sites of provocation. <laughs> the diver diversity of manifestations mirror the diversity of members that take part in the movement. Class, gender, and race diversity are displayed. Suddenly, our streets, our streets become the Chile that many of us dream. In June 6, 100, no, yes, 100,000 estimated people convey in the streets of Santiago. In this march, a contingent of shirtless women with their faces covered in balaclavas takes the streets dancing and chanting a sort of feminist haka. The contingent is composed mainly by students of Universidad Católica. There's a clear relation between the occupation of the Universidad Católica and the public blasts of the students demonstrating their freedom and power in the streets. The masked and mute breasts have genealogies in past protest repertoires, but it also reproposes, reproposes new forms of wearing the balaclavas and performing nudity. Each protester personalized their own knitted max with embroidery. Balaclavas are a trace of the slow and careful collective preparation of the performance. Students prepare together their combatic armor in the slow temporality of crafts. The masks are used to hide personal identities, but they are not devices of anonymity. Subjects are there in the colors of the stitches and the little stones, each of them decided to sew on their slow-made feminist helmets. Their new torsos become signs of riot and resistance, displacing sexualized and maternal connotations linked iteratively to the female bodies. At a certain point, the contingent climbs onto status. One of a former bishop, this is uh, in front of Universidad Católica, <laughs> Their bodies sweat victory on the symbols of the church, deeply questioned in those days in Chile because of clamorous cases of sexual abuse, and also on the power of the university and the hierarchy of men. The, fem and the, hierarchy of men. the feminist tsunami is now gone. Students and faculties are back to their classrooms. But the tsunami left behind experiences embedded in bodies that practiced a way of assembly of accompanying each other, of being together to metamorphose vulnerab vulnerability into political action. So, what we can do when there's nothing to be done? Well, we can always sue balaclavas in the relentless collective times of sorority and put them on, and then occupy the streets, climb onto the status of patriarchy, and mobilize until we create change, while fiercely chanting, y como, y como, y como es la wea, nos mata ni nos viola ni nadie hace na. What's up, what's up, what is this going down? They kill us, they rape us, and no one makes a frown. Thank you.
Thank you so much for that powerful presentation and uh, to the organizers for including me in this um, esteemed company. I'm taking us to a different location, to Palestine and the inextricable transnational entwinements between Palestine and here in the United States. But I have to say that in the course of your talk, I lost myself. Um, my body floated and at the risk of being unintentionally reductionist, I felt just a woman in the world. So thank you so much for that. On May 14th of this year, we bore witness to the murder of 58 Palestinians by Israeli snipers who gathered in mass protest on their lands in Gaza while they posed no lethal harm to any Israeli civilians or military installations. U.S. media framed the protests as a response to Trump, the Trump announcement's embassy move to Jerusalem. But that was just a good media hook. Palestinians in the Gaza Strip had been gathering in the largest civil society protests every Friday, for every Friday since late April, and planned to convene for every Friday until mid-May in what they called the Great Return March. They demanded an end to a decade-long siege that kept them just above starvation. They demanded the right to return to their homes and their lands. And they demanded, most fundamentally of all, freedom. Israel used lethal force on the first day of the protest in late April, and within six weeks had shot to kill 115 Palestinians and injured and maimed over 3,000. Of those killed, 94% were shot above the waist. Israel has justified its use of force as security necessity, and in a unanimous ruling on May 24th, moving in lockstep with its army and political branches, the Israeli Supreme Court rejected petitions filed by human rights groups against the military's use of live fire against protesters, sanctioning the continuation of the state's shoot-to-kill policy. Unlike in Israel's large-scale military offensives launched between winter 2008 and the summer 2014, this time Hamas shot not a single rocket, not a single mortar into Israel. In fact, it was trying to hijack the protests and to claim responsibility for them in order to increase its popularity amongst Palestinians and yet failed. Palestinian civilians seeking freedom and inspiring resilience took credit for this massive organization and mobilization. Still, and nonetheless, the US political establishment and media decried the Palestinians, the massacre of Palestinians as noble in the, in the pursuance of Israel's self-defense. In fact, the Washington Post editorial team that week ran a headline titled, Hamas's New War. Like nearly all Palestinian protests, civilian flotillas to break the blockade, the grassroots, global, nonviolent boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign, the poetry of Darin Tatur, youth groups in Silwan, theater groups in Jenin, Israel, together with its primary ally, the United States, have framed all Palestinian resistance to their erasure, dispossession, and removal as the threat to Israel's self-defense. How can we understand this and respond, and I'll flip this and ask it as a question, to the provocation of what can we do when there is nothing left to be done? We should understand Israel's use of deadly force within Israel's broader settler colonial ambitions. Palestinians have always been marked as a threat for the challenge they pose to Jewish Zionist settler sovereignty, and Israel's security framework refl reflects a deep-seated settler anxiety. Since the founding violence of the Israeli state, in which 750,000 native Palestinians were killed or expelled from their homeland during the 1948 Nakba, in Arabic for catastrophe, Palestinians have been criminalized as an inherent threat to Israeli territorial control. An examination of Israel's policies towards native Palestinians demonstrates the use of lethal force as an organizing principle of the state settler colonial project framed in the language of military necessity. In, in, in 1947, when the UN proposed partition of the Palestine mandate, 
into a Jewish and an Arab state, the demographic balance thwarted Israel's realization of an exclusive homeland. Jews only constituted 30% of the total population. In addition, the status quo of population and land ownership necessitated a radical redistribution to achieve partition that could only be achieved and realized by force in light of Arab opposition to the UN plan. Zionists pursued this radical reordering by forcibly removing and or encouraging flight of Palestinians under the pretext of military necessity. Between 1947 and March 1949, when Israel established armistice agreements with belligerent Arab states, nearly 80% of the native Palestinian population was removed in what became Israel. Israel has forbidden the return of these Palestinians to maintain a decisive Jewish majority, demographic majority. Its founding fathers insisted that such a majority was necessary to ensure the state's viability, thus equating its existence with this demographic equation. Moreover, Israel's mythology of uninterrupted Jewish presence has demanded the erasures of markers of native Palestinian belonging. Together, these have defined Palestinians as a threat for merely existing. In 1965, in fact, when Palestinians attempted to return by foot, then Chief General of the Army, Itzhak Rabin, suggested that troops kill the first hundred refugees returning from Gaza to, quote, ensure that the rest will go back to Gaza. This should help us understand the Trump administration's recent announcement that it will cease pr providing $364 million in humanitarian aid to the UN Refugee Agency for Palestinian Refugees. This policy reflects a long-term goal of the Israel lobby, which has sought to resolve the Palestinian refugee question by revoking their status and disappearing them. Under this administration, which moved the embassy to Jerusalem and did millions of dollars of aid to the West Bank, removed the descriptor occupied from Palestinian territories and State Department reports, closed the de facto Palestinian embassy in Washington, we are witnessing the final end to the so-called peace process, which was never about establishing a Palestinian state, but always about establishing and entrenching an autonomy arrangement for Palestinians without the guarantee of sovereignty. Indeed. What is to be done now? Palestinians understand we have no choice but to continue a freedom struggle. That means engaging in mass protests, telling our stories to audiences who do not believe us, engaging in boycott, divestment, and sanctions, but it also means continuing to build coalitions with other groups and peoples and individuals also seeking and struggling for their freedom. During the height of the Third World's challenge to Western hegemony, featuring revolutionary nationalist armed struggles across the Middle East, Africa, Asia, the PLO and black radical liberation organizations in the United States forged an alliance in joint struggle against imperialism. Historic articulations of black Palestinian solidarity framed racism and colonialism as entwined and co-constitutive structures of domination and sought to unravel them in the United States in Israel, Palestine, and across the globe. While this fervent solidarity has collapsed in the folds of a collapsed internationalism, events in Gaza and Ferguson in the summer 2014 prompted an organic renewal of black Palestinian solidarity and signaled an analytical return. We continue to forge that solidarity through delegations to Palestine and from Palestine to the United States in joint protests, in campaigns targeting G4S and other companies that are, are in the business of military and carceral technologies uh, to suppress populations and racial minorities. We continue to forge that solidarity and in our organizing to identify new horizons for freedom and new models in excess of sovereignty. Far from giving up, Palestinians, like all humans, and more, are more resolute in ending their condition of unfreedom. As the odds worsen, human commitment to struggle only increases. As for where to draw our hope from, I will end with the words of Ulfat al-Kurd, a human rights advocate in Gaza who explains that Palestinians continue to gather in protest despite the threat to their lives. He writes, nowhere in Gaza is safe. Israeli planes can bomb any house, anywhere, 
at any moment. The protests are a rare opportunity for us to breathe, meet people, and feel we belong to something larger than ourselves. We can't go to the beach any longer because sewage infrastructure has collapsed and raw sewage flows into the sea. Many Gazans live in abject poverty and cannot afford to sit in a cafe or restaurant, so they come to the protests with a coffee thermos and food. The protests have given us all a spark of hope. They are our attempt to cry out to the world that it must wake up, that there are people here fighting for their basic lives. We deserve to live too. Indeed, we all deserve to live. We are all Gaza. And like Palestinians in Gaza, we must continue to find hope in our collective resistance. Thank you. I want to thank the organizers as well um, for the opportunity to talk about um, these important struggles uh, today. So thank you. The racism, corruption, and brutality of the Trump administration have been held up as a horrible yet unique rupture with our recent past. It is the anti-American exceptionalism or posed as such, an unrepresentative expression of supposed American values and principles. The narrative of a supposed norm erosion represented by the Trump administration threatens to obscure, if not completely obliterate, the ways in which the continuity with the distant and immediate past unite this administration with what preceded it. Indeed, the interlocking and persisting norms of white supremacy, police terrorism, and racial subjugation have not been eroded, but emboldened by Trump and his acolytes. The understandable and welcome contempt for this kleptocratic and racially malignant administration cannot, however, be used to sanitize the regimes of repression that came before. We must resist the temptation to get things back to normal. Returning, returning to the roots of the Black Lives Matter movement allows us to reject romantic delusions of the past while pressing the urgency to address the violence and abjection of this administration. We do not have the luxury to choose one or the other. Both are critical to the struggles we are engaged in. The Ferguson Rebellion, was democracy come alive. There are many ways to measure the inequality experienced by African Americans, but the wanton violence and abuse of American police remained the visceral edge of the compromised nature of black citizenship. The heroism of Ferguson generated an enormous sense of solidarity. There was a feeling that they were fighting for all of us when they refused to submit to the authoritarian brutality of the area police forces, but they also refused to acquiesce to the chorus of liberal and Democratic Party operatives who told them to get off the streets. For them and for us, democracy would be forged in the crucible of the street, the street meetings, the night marches, the demonstrations themselves. Before they were the Ferguson generation, they were the Obama generation, young black people who had believed in the slogan, yes, we can, who voted like they had never voted before, but who had also grown tired and weary of cheap campaign slogans, paternalistic scolding, and a lightweight political agenda that did next to nothing to restore the enormous losses wrought by the financial crisis of 2008. With big expectations from the first black president came big disappointment with the failure to deliver. It was in the streets where the promise or even the possibility of democracy or their, that their voices could finally be heard. The tributaries of Ferguson, Cleveland, Los Angeles, Staten Island, and many others 
fed the watershed that became Black Lives Matter in the late fall and young winter of 2014 and 2015. Tens of thousands of people from across the country participated in acts of nonviolent civil disobedience. They marched through the streets with chants that connected Ferguson, Missouri to New York City and then the nation. Hands up, don't shoot, I can't breathe, Black Lives Matter. There were protests scattered across the nation in cities large and small through the chant demand declaration Black Lives Matter in ways similar to the cry Freedom Now during the Civil Rights Movement. This history and context matters because we are faced with the challenge of not only the persistence of police terror, but also the continuation of the racism, poverty, inequality, and subjugation that is wielded to justify and rationalize the policing state. Since 2015 and the emergence of Black Lives Matter as a national movement, police in the United States have killed more than 4,208 people, a disproportionate number of whom are African American. White supremacy pulses at the center of this nation's governing institutions. What can we do? By the presidential election of 2016, Black Lives Matter had been chastised for lacking an agenda and definitive goals. It was a message intended to split the movement. The political status quo attempted to force the movement to narrow its perspective and him and its horizons to shift its demand from what it wanted to what was possible. In reality, the real problem was that much of the movement had objectives that were not in sync with the political status quo, including the abolition of police, prisons, and the massive distribution of wealth and resources from the rich to the working class. This was the real problem with the movement for the Democratic Party and their liberal supporters. But there was another wing of the movement that was open to the possibility of perhaps negotiating with the political establishment to reach a different set of goals in the hope of accompl accomplishing something called police reform. Indeed, when an activist, a black woman from Chicago named Asleen Pulley from, uh, uh, from Black Lives Matter refused to go to a closed door meeting at the White House, President Barack Obama personally called her out saying, quote, the value of social movements and activism is to get you at the table, get you in the room, and then start trying to figure out how this problem is going to be solved. You then have a responsibility to prepare an agenda that is achievable, that can institutionalize the changes you seek and to engage the other side. It was quintessential American liberalism, the notion that the rule of law our two-party system and the existing institutions can deliver the change we, also, we all desperately desire. But even if we put aside that it was the rule of law, the two parties, and the existing institutions that created the subjected status of black people in the first place, putting that aside, one might consider that if our institutions were capable of this feat, it would have already happened. The old framework of from protest to politics, first argued by Bayard Rustin, suggested that the shift to formal politics was a sign of political maturity, that we can not just protest endlessly. But it has never been protest for protest's sake. It has been about creating a mechanism that preserves the interests of those outside of the corrupting and tranquilizing influence of electoral politics. In fact, everything that we have resembling protest has come through struggle. It has come through urgency, determination, and the creativity of ordinary people in this country. Oseline Pulley, the working class black woman from Chicago, chastised for refusing to show up to the White House, had a different vision of change. She wrote, I could not with any integrity participate in such a sham that would go to serve to legitimize the false narrative that the government is working to end police brutality. For increasing numbers of families fighting for justice and dignity and their kin, for their kin slain by police, I refuse to give its perpetuators and enablers political cover by making an appearance among them. 
We assert that true revolutionary and systemic change will ultimately only be brought forth by ordinary working people, students, and youth organizing, marching, and taking power from the corrupt elites. The transformative power of the social movement is not only about its coercive influence in policymaking or the governing institutions, but we must also consider the power of collective organizing and movements on ourselves. The radical artist and critic John Berger wrote in 1968 about mass demonstrations, quote, theoretically demonstrations are meant to reveal the strength of popular opinion or feeling. Theoretically, they are an appeal to the democratic conscience of the state. In this sense, Berger wrote that the numbers present at protests are significant, not because of their impact on the state, but on those who participate. Continuing, the importance of the numbers involved is to be found in the direct experience of those taking part in or sympathetically witnessing the demonstration. For them, the numbers cease to be numbers and become the evidence of their senses, the conclusions of their imaginations. The larger the demonstration, the more powerful and immediate a metaphor it becomes for their total collective strength. Black Lives Matter is an entry point into the examination of a society that locks people into perpetual poverty and inequality and then cages and ruthlessly punishes them when they dare to challenge or reject their condition, like Palestine. Social movements can certainly challenge the methods of policing, the conditions that make black people vulnerable to policing, and they can even get some methods of policing or incarceration to stop. The mass movement also opens up greater questions about the nature of society while simultaneously creating the possibility of changing those such circumstances. But to change the world, we must also be changed. This doesn't mean that elections are irrelevant, but it does mean that no one is coming to save us. It means standing face to face with the reality that racism, class inequality, and gender hatred is so deeply wound into the marrow of this nation that it is scarcely known a single period where those were not the defining features of American society. Yes, it is true there are better or worse elected officials, but what can never be forgotten is that in the constant weighing of who or what party is the greater evil, we never engage with the larger issue of how we get free. Finally, the dialectic of reform and revolution cannot be unleashed by privileging one above the other. Instead, the fight for our daily lives is a precondition for imagining a different world altogether. Black Lives Matter as a belief, an utterance, a collective chant, and a possibility is an example of this. From Ferguson to the Baltimore Rebellion, the commitment, solidarity, and struggles of young black people provided a glimpse of freedom to those living under the policeman's boot for their entire lives. They are the future. so that the audience has a little more time. I just want to make a few comments about threads that I heard throughout each of the presentations um, that we can think about as we move forward, uh, using the words of the presenters themselves. That um, one of the things that most struck me was the kind of um, emergence of a sort of understanding of what protest movements can achieve and what they, what they actually can accomplish beyond um, transforming or changing um, the state. Um, Aisha said that um, the protests uh, in Turkey created a space where, that people created together where they felt safest. It was a way of saying yes to ourselves that is a way, by saying yes to ourselves is a way of saying no to injustice. And quoting the great Grace Lee Boggs that activism can be the journey and not the arrival. Uh, 
Maria talking about Chile, that um, one of the things that was so extraordinary about that presentation was the place of humor, the place of the body, the place of uh, joining together in a kind of theatrical, performative nature of protests um, that was not only about a place for our fear and rage, but what she called a way to also build upon our hope and our happiness. And I was really struck by the vocabulary of gestures that I saw in those photographs that I think travel, those gestures travel, whether they be hands up, don't shoot, or even um, what looked to me like twerking, right? <laughs> um, as a form of protest, which we also see in Black Lives Matter movements. Mm -hmm. um, Nora's, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the place of humor as well. Nora is reminding us of the importance of history, a kind of historical depth that we forget if we only get our understanding of protests in Palestine from the corporate media or from the Israeli state, um, reminding us the stories, um, the role, the important role of stories that we must continue to tell them even as we tell them, and these were her words, to unbelieving audiences. Um, and that despite the threat to their lives, that protests provide a rare opportunity for people to breathe, uh, to feel that they are part of something larger than themselves. And then Kienga with that very powerful closing presentation, um, who again reminded us to think about history which will keep us or allow us to resist the temptation to go back, to get back to normal resist the temptation to get back to normal, and that protest numbers matter not because of their impact on the state, but because of their impact on the, participation, the participant and the observer as a measure of our strength. Uh, to ch change the world, we must also be changed. And these, each of these are phrases that came from individual presentations and yet I believe resonate throughout um, what we've heard today. So I'd like to give the panelists um, the opportunity to speak to each other or raise it if you had a question or something you wanted to engage, and then we'll collect the questions from the audience. Uh, any comments from <coughs> panelists, comments, questions, points of coming together or separating? <laughs> Okay, we can open it up to questions. I think um, those questions have been collected. We're collecting them and then we will read them. All right, I'll read them together and then um, panelists can respond. How do speakers see the role of labor as formal labor unions and other forms, especially um, unions, continue to lose power and legal status? Uh, so the role of labor. And um, the second question, what are your thoughts on a new zeal for power, the seat at the table, that is transcribed in the world of the new influencers. Um, and I think that we touched upon that with um, Kienga's uh, mm -hmm. presentation as well. So the role of labor and the new zeal for the seat at the table, um, which is even Solange's album. <laughs> so. Thoughts? I'm happy to start us off and just say that in some context, um, Labor uh, has a counterintuitive function. So in the same way that we think about slavery not as the exploitation of workers, but rather as the commodification of bodies. And so the question of labor there is disrupted. So too in a settler colonial context is the framework of labor disrupted because unlike in a, in a, in a colonial situation where the idea is to increasingly exploit uh, the native in settler colonialism, the idea is to eliminate the native altogether. And so their labor, becomes um, it, one, undesired, but also threatening. And we see that very, very, very clearly in the Gaza Strip, where there's no economy whatsoever. So to then, you know, in that framework, to think about what does labor do in this situation, 
um, is, is to really get to the heart of the issue of what is the structure that we are dealing with um, and where can we even, what, is, what, is, what are the possibilities of creating those conditions where workers can and basically take you know, the, the reins of their own lives and the conditions and the, and the production of their own foods and goods and homes where in fact all of those things become primary targets um, during these military onslaughts? Um, I'll just say that in some ways I think the, the questions are connected. Um, in the US, uh, the American context, the formal um, labor movement, so we think about the AFL, uh, CIO, and the big labor organizations, um, I think have been so consumed with the seat at the table and access to political power uh, that it's made them relatively impotent as there has been uh, you know, a, a multi-decade assault on the living standards um, of ordinary working class people. If we think about uh, the regressive tax bill passed by the Trump administration um, earlier this year and the fact that there was no organized response uh, from formal labor uh, I think speaks to, um, in some ways, if I can put the point sharply, to the rot that exists um, at the top of the labor movement. On the other hand, we've seen what can be, in some ways, described as a rank and file rebellion uh, over the last uh, several months, particularly of teachers and educators who have been cut so deeply to the bone that they have no other choice but to, uh, but to fight, but to reject, in many ways, the conservatism uh, of their uh, uh, leadership to fight for their very lives, and in doing so, to fight for the lives uh, of working class students who still remain um, dependent on public education. And so I think you see the two uh, uh, bi-directional um, uh, strategies uh, for reviving um, the labor movement, which I think is incredibly important at this point in time where labor is mostly women, labor is mostly uh, of color, and so you know we tend to have these very old ideas about what the labor movement is or who workers are, um, but the ability to uh, sustain a struggle and fight um, at this time when there is being uh, an attempt to redistribute wealth from the bottom to the top uh, is incredibly important. I, I mean, reflecting uh, from the context of Turkey, it's almost impossible for labor to do anything um, meaningful, uh, both because of neoliberal policies and also the recent uh, more authoritarian uh, pressures. But what I see as the better story of labor organizing more recently is really, again, the women, and especially the feminist women and queer women in labor organizations that are changing these organizations from within and making them a lot more creative and responsive, um, not only to the situation, but also in terms of imagining what can be a different form of organizing uh, for the future. And there are really uh, a lot of great examples uh, of that. And I think the question of labor is important, and the question of mass organizing, as Kian was reminding us, is also important. Um, it becomes really important when we are faced with crises, such as, for instance, uh, the one that we're facing as educators in Turkey, uh, thousands of high school uh, and primary school teachers and hundreds of academics have uh, lost their jobs. And it was the uh, teachers' union that has been the most, and that continues to be the most significant source of solidarity, because material solidarity can be really important uh, uh, in, uh, in times like this. And it was great to have that organizing there to, um, to organize uh, around. Um, so it reminds us that we should not, I mean, there might be need for changing these old structures that in some ways contribute to the problems of the system and that have become a part of the problem uh, itself, but it's very important to continue to work through them and to uh, help them uh, move into a future where um, um, they can respond and uh, create more spaces of uh, solidarity and political action. Uh, well, in Chile, the formal labor unions are uh, also very entangled into political institutionality. Uh, uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, and, there is a, and they exclude a very important and emerging uh, population of workers uh, that uh, come from other countries. So migration in Chile is just, uh, 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 it's just starting to happen in the last uh, uh, few years. So there is a very uh, vulnerable working population coming from Venezuela, from IT, and these are workers that uh, are excluded from the formal uh, unions. What I find interesting is that this feminist uh, movement, um, uh, this feminist tsunami, uh, entangled issues of, 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 of gender also with the problems uh, in the organization of, of, of workers. And for instance, in the university where I work, one of the uh, points uh, that the movement established to start the negotiation with the president was that the problems with the contract of migrant uh, work outsource workers would be solved. So they didn't even sit into the table before that. That was point number one. And I, th and I think this is very interesting uh, also because it comes back to the history of feminism in Chile. In the early 20th century, feminism uh, starts in the mines of Salitre, I know what the word is, but north mines, uh, and women start organizing with the working class, and that's the, the starting point of uh, feminist organizations in Chile. So I find it very interesting that now we are kind of re, uh, mm -hmm. going back to this uh, entanglement between uh, the organizations of women and workers. It, um, resonates across all of your responses that the, um, there is a, actually a transformation going on in terms of what we understand labor to be and who mm -hmm. we understand mm -hmm. workers to be mm -hmm. in all of these instances. Um, let's see, okay, two. Can panelists address the relation between various kinds of protests, actions, and building movement for actual revolution changing the basic organizational structures of society, not a seat at the table. <laughs> and then um, let's do that one and then we'll come back to, to this one because, yeah. So, relation between various kinds of protest actions and movement building for actual revolution, changing the base basic organizational structure of society, not a seat at the table. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, in, in the spirit of, of creating a little bit of momentum, because I certainly don't have the, the right answers to this or the best ones, certainly on this panel, but this is how I'm thinking about it, and I was inspired by um, Kianga's comments on what the rebellion meant, and thinking back to a moment in the summer 2014 at the Shavitz Arena in St. Louis, Mm -hmm. when uh, Cornell William Brooks, the mm -hmm. NAACP <laughs> president, was giving yes. a talk and a sermon and using his, you know, black movement and we are, we shall overcome. Sit down. And, <laughs> and the young people, the young people in the arena stood up, turned their backs to him and said, let them speak and disrupted the entire event until two young organizers who were in the streets, who were putting their bodies on the line, who were creating new realities, were invited to take the stage instead. And so I take from that, and I take also from the synergies of black Palestinian solidarity, which is, a, which is not a slogan. It's a political space. It's a platform we've created. It's an analytical framework. It's a practice. But in that space, what I find that we're doing is we're creating new ways of being in the world that don't necessarily exist. Now put that into conversation, well, but then what, what about the revolution? Well, the revolution is in that, right? The revolution is in be able, being able to imagine what self-determination looks like in the excess of sovereignty. Mm. Outside of being able to govern ourselves, what do we look like when we can just take care of one another? What does that look like when you do it in the, when you're talking about the Turkish professors who are meditating and dancing, that sounds right to me, right? You are actually, you are looking past. You are not even looking at the institutions that are excluding you. You're looking past them to think about what are ways that we can relate to one another that 
that recreate norms so that we stop taking for granted that our history and our lived realities were our inevitable conditions. This is not an inevitable condition. We constructed this condition. And so I think that in this work that we're doing together, we're constructing new conditions and new alternatives. That's great. <laughs> I think that's great. Exactly um, what I would have liked to say and couldn't have said. You put it so beautifully. And what I've come to realize through our work is that a lot of our fears about the need to look inside as much as to look outside, um, fearing you know, that we will um, isolate ourselves, we will lose our anger, we won't be able to act in the world anymore, it has actually been the opposite. Mm. Uh, a lot of activists, for instance, in our work came in burned out and really having lost hope at not only intervening in the outside outside, but also in their own organizations, because especially when there's very little to be done, especially when we're surrounded with such destructive energy and we're not able to express it, we're not able to change it, we're not able to make a difference uh, in that outside world, that anger gets um, inverted mm -hmm. inside to the organization and to our own selves. And so there's this incredibly self-destructive um, energy mm -hmm. that I know a lot of uh, groups are suffering from. And so that creates a lot of um, you know, hopelessness. We're not able to uh, change anything. So through the work that we did, um, I mean, at the end of the year, so almost everyone was saying, now I'm able to do more and with more energy mm -hmm. and I have much more clarity as to what I should do. And I know that with these new ways of um, looking into myself, understanding myself and changing myself, revolutionizing my way of being in the world and my way of doing politics, I actually have something to offer. And they have been offering this to uh, dozens and hundreds of other um, uh, activists. And so there's this, it creates this new energy and new hope that exactly as you said, we're not stuck with this, you know, um, mutual energies of destruction. Somebody does something, you know, I crash with that, and we're, we're, we're in fact, we in fact become dependent on them as we s remain in the space of reaction. But it is possible to imagine something new and to imagine a different way of being in this world and relating to each other and to put it into action. And I, I mean, the short answer to that to the question, I think, is none of these different forms of acting substitute one another. We need all. We need everything that we've heard um, uh, on this panel. Um, but we need to do each one with a different attitude, I think. And that has been a, I, what I heard was a great conversation as to how we can bring in the body, how we can reconnect to ourselves and each other in new ways to go past and imagine um, a different future, which is exactly what revolution is, as you said. Yeah. Well, thinking about uh, different kinds of protests, in, the, in Chile it's very interesting to notice uh, uh, the continuities and these continuities uh, throughout the, in the last decades of protests. This feminist tsunami is, has a genealogy and linkage also with the student movements of mm -hmm. 2006, 2011, 2014. So there are continuities, but there are also discontinuities. And that, uh, that means that the, 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 the protests and the ways of expressing and of political action are also mobilizing. Uh, in the, for instance, one discontinuity of this movement is the lack of, of, of uh, leaders, uh, of, uh, of leaders that you can identify. In the student movements, we had three or four very important uh, leaders, uh, here the power and the, it's much more uh, uh, distributed. Uh, also the, the way the occupations of the, of the universities takes place has been changing. Uh, in the student mobilization it was, uh, they also, they kind of reproduce a hierarchic uh, power establishment, so they had like roles and leaders, and instead the feminist occupations are uh, much more distributed. The assemblies take almost all of the decisions. And there's also something uh, that I link with Aisha's experience, that uh, they look, they, they also do uh, activities, dancing and, uh, and workshops and, and different kind of things, trying to connect not only in resistance, uh, but also 
throughout joy and creativity. And I think that is uh, something very important for the continuity of the, of the movement. And uh, for the question set for actual revolution, and again, what is revolution? At what scale <laughs> are we thinking? Uh, for us, this uh, May, feminist May in Chile, made a big, big change, for instance, in the way we are teaching, mm -hmm. in the way we are approaching our students, in the way students are approaching themselves. I work in a school of theater where the, the body uh, is very important, so we are rethinking everything, how to teach movement, mm -hmm. how to teach voice, how to teach acting, uh, how should the bodies of the students relate to each other. So these are also little revolutions or <laughs> micro uh, resistances or little uh, practices of resistance. Um, there, there are two things. One, the seat at the table is attractive because it seems possible. Um, it seems uh, reachable in ways that revolution doesn't. Um, so I think that's... That's one thing with why that um, is constantly a tension uh, within um, social movements. But um, since Lenin was an inspiration for the title, um, when talking about revolution, uh, Lenin wrote that part of the calculus um, in determining whether or not you were actually in a revolutionary uh, period was about whether or not the, the masses, whether or not the mass of the population were unwilling to be ruled in the old way, and that the leadership could no longer rule um, in the old way, that there was a significant social break that disallowed for the continuing of the status quo and normal um, social relations. And so there's lots that go, that go into that. But one of the reasons why I think in all of the things that we've been talking about, the role of the social movement and mass demonstrations are so important is because it raises the possibility uh, of what is possible, but also through the process um, of struggle, it heightens one's expectations of what can be done, because that's usually what the state is responsive to in some way or another. So for all those young black people who participated in these mobilizations, in, in Ferguson in particular, somewhere like Baltimore, and watch for the first time state actors actually have a reaction that was something other than ignoring them, mm -hmm. um, it sends a message about what is actually effective and, and what has been ineffective up into that, uh, up into that point. And so I think that um, that, that is an important uh, part of it. But uh, some of this is, are things that happen on a social level that don't have much to do with the role of activists or, or radicals or organizers. There's a, a, a process which I think in some ways is unfolding, even if it feels slow in the United States, this process of radicalization a word that has been abused you know, within the, the, the security state of post 9-11 uh, society. But really, what Ella Baker talked about, what Angela Davis talks about, which is a key factor of radicalization, what does it mean to get to the root, to get at what is beneath in society that is, is really making these things happen? What is at the, at, at the, at the root of it? And I think that once there, is uh, the, the chasm between what you were told about what society is, which in the United States is, is all kinds of mythologies and nonsense, and then what your own experiences are, combined with a, a, a hope that things can be different and a desire for things to be different, therein lies the, the potential. So there's a whole combination of things that have to do with an understanding of history, and where we have come from and what has actually created the possibilities for change before. It has to do, in some ways, with organization. It has to do with struggle. It also it has to do with things like hope. I mean, hope is not religious faith that some other entity or body can change things. It's, it's really a very elemental desire for things to be different. And so I think that 
you know, there, there, there are different parts to that. But I do think that part of the, the last thing I'll say is that some of this relies on thinking beyond the parameters that we are so trained uh, to, 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 to think about things in. And so that means, you know, what everyone has talked about, imagining what a different kind of society would look like, because that has to be a part of uh, any kind of real discussion about trying to actually achieve that. Let's thank these wonderful presenters. <laughs> Thanks to these wonderful speakers, to all our speakers who came today um, and accepted our invitation. Much to discuss. We now have a coffee break, so let's talk more informally and please reconvene promptly at noon.